obviously. Okay, so our wrap-up panel is going to be emerging best practices and translating university research into innovation. I think a topic that's very important for everybody and see the experience that we have. And we have uh, three speakers, uh, Frederick uh, Farina, who is a former research engineer, but is currently Caltech's innovation and corporate partnership officer. And his responsibilities include commercializing inventions made at Caltech and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory through new startup ventures and partnerships with established companies. Uh, Oren Herskovitz, who is the Vice President of Intellectual Property and Technology Transfer for Columbia University, as well as Executive Director of Columbia Technology Ventures. He's also an adjunct professor, Columbia Business and Engineering Schools. And then Dean Chang, Associate Vice President for Innovation Entrepreneurship at the University of Maryland. He leads the campus-wide Academy for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. He's also a lead PI and instructor in the National Science Foundation to i Node program. And uh, unlike the last panel, our first two speakers have coordinated their talks. And uh, because they often are on panels together on this subject. And so uh, I will turn it over to uh, Fred. <laughs> a little late, but uh, by the way, I, I'm filling in for my vice president for research, uh, Professor Maury Gareeb, who's going to be here today. So, as uh, I'll follow uh, Rick's advice earlier to improvise. Uh, but um, Oren and I have combined our talks because uh, we thought it made, made a lot of sense. We want to make sure that people can ask questions and make it interactive. Uh, all the uh, issues we're going to talk about are. We have the same views on most of them, uh, save a few. So that's the reason for that. I think we're going to go through like a two-minute introduction, so everyone. Um, I'll start. My name is Fred Farina. I'm at Caltech. I, I run the Office of Tech Transfer and Corporate Partnerships. My uh, background, um, it's interesting because in tech transfer, people come from all walks of life, whether they come from technology, uh, industry, business, legal, humanities. There's a, a whole uh, sector of people represented. And so mine is through engineering. Uh, I'm an electro engineer. I work at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in engineering research uh, for uh, almost 10 years, and then went into intellectual property at a law firm, became a patent agent, and then came to Caltech in tech transfer about 15 years ago. So that's been my uh, trajectory. Then maybe uh, Oren, sure. you want to say? So Oren Herskowitz from Columbia University. Um, I've been at Columbia 10 years. I'm actually, to Fred's point, I never had a faculty position prior to coming to Columbia. I'm an English major with an MBA. I don't have a technical background or a law background. So I'm guessing that puts me a little bit at odds with the audience um, in terms of backgrounds. Um, was at the Boston, I'd been at a couple of startups, very small scale, was at the Boston Consulting Group for seven years doing strategy consulting, and was brought into Columbia 10 years ago after doing a study for Mayor Bloomberg in New York about the future of New York as a biotech cluster. Um, where I learned that this field existed. Um, as an English major, you don't have much exposure to it. Um, so um, came in for what I thought was going to be a one or two year role, um, helping to set up sort of the operations, financial, IT structures, policies, practices, more of the strategy piece. And then when my predecessor left, I took over the role. Uh, and that's now it's 10 years and counting. Um, in addition to the role in the tech transfer office, as was mentioned, I teach a class called Intellectual Property for Startups which is jointly taught between the business, engineering, and law schools. And last year, we made it completely open, so it's open to any faculty, staff, graduate students, or anyone else around the university. Um, it's been very popular. And we also help run um, three different grant-funded accelerators for startups, one in medical devices and imaging, which is funded by the Coulter Foundation very generously, one uh, in clean energy called PowerBridge, which was also very generously funded by NYSERDA, the New York State Energy Research Development Authority. Um, and the third is the New York City Media Lab, which is a terrible name because it implies it competes with MIT, which we wouldn't even try to do. Um, but it brings together the startups, big media companies, and university researchers in New York. And that was funded by the city of New York. Uh, my name's Dean Chang. Uh, that's actually my, my name, not my title. My mom appointed me Dean, uh, so I can't be fired. 
Um, I do work for the provost, but uh, I'm still dean if, even if she fires me. Um, <laughs> I've actually spent most of my career in industry. I worked, uh, when I was doing my PhD at Stanford in Robotics, there was a gentleman in my lab uh, who started a company, spun it out, and I joined as one of the very early employees. Um, our first board member was Steve Blank, for those of you who are familiar with the Lean Startup Methods, of which uh, i is largely based. Um, and if you read the book uh, Lean Startup, it chronicles uh, by Eric Reese, uh, this very successful startup venture practicing Lean Startup and what's uh, preached in i -Corps. But the book also references everything they did wrong in their previous company. Uh, that's a company we invested in. Um, so <laughs> most of what I'm sharing are basically lessons learned from what we did wrong. Um, and uh, just grateful to be here today and look forward to connecting with a lot of you. So the agenda we're going to follow today, you see in front of you, uh, after the introduction, we'll go and uh, introduce our respective tech, tech transfer offices. Uh, Oren and I will, will do that. Um, and uh, after that, we'll go over, uh, again, in a very uh, interactive fashion between the two of us, we'll cover the recent trends that are emerging in the field. Uh, then Dean will take over to talk about uh, i -Corps. Uh, and we'll have a Q&A at the end. At any time, feel free to interrupt. We like a lot of questions and a lot of interaction, so we appreciate it if you raise your hand. There will be a reminder on every slide. Okay. So as far as Caltech is concerned, um, we have a model that's not, uh, as far as mission statement, uh, similar to most places that uh, because we are a non-for-profit, we are mostly federal funded, although we're private, 90 plus percent of our funding is federal. We do have a mission to uh, take the discoveries and inventions out to society for the benefits of society. And one of the distinctions of our institute is that we've, um, in recent times, combined all activities having to do with tech transfer, corporate partnerships, social property, entrepreneurship under one roof, to make a to create a one-stop shop so that industry knows where to go, uh, whatever their needs are, whether they need a licensing, a patent, or a uh, research collaboration, a contracts to follow that up, uh, any kinds of documents. And uh, I have to say that uh, that made has made the interactions much much easier. You have one contact that is able to manage the whole relationship, uh, uh, similar to an account manager. And from a company's perspective, our goal is that they only see that person and they don't see the inner workings of the sausage making of the university. It can be you know, difficult to navigate, uh, particularly at large universities uh, where you have to involve uh, the Office of General Counsel, the Office of Sponsored Research, the different departments and divisions. And all that happens in the background. Uh, so that's been very useful. To give you some statistics uh, about what the office does, so Caltech is a small, very small university. We have just shy of 300 faculty members, uh, although we are very focused on science and engineering. Uh, that's uh, so, so 300 faculty members last year created uh, 228 invention disclosures, which is really, really high. Uh, we also have a, a very aggressive patenting strategy. Uh, we believe that it's uh, very difficult to predict uh, successes, uh, particularly uh, given the type of research we do, which is fundamental and oftentimes early stage. And therefore, instead of um, evaluating inventions, we actually err on the side of patenting them. And that makes the faculty very happy oftentimes. Um, and we have a pretty high number of startups created every year. 12 is, is a about an average year for, for us, again, based on 300 faculty members uh, and uh, 2,000 students. Our whole model uh, for our office is a service to the faculty. If you strip down everything to it, it's about servicing the faculty. Uh, if they uh, tell us jump, we instantly ask how high, and that's the way uh, we, we, we do business there. Um, and I think uh, that aspect sometimes is a bit uh, uh, overlooked at universities, and I think it's a key aspect to engage the faculty in the process and support them in the activity. Uh, and I think if you work on the campus at Caltech and ask people, what do you think of OTT, now OTTCP, corporate partnerships, uh, most of the time you get a thumbs up, thumbs up, and at a lot of universities, oftentimes you get 
bureaucratic, too slow, too this, too that. So I think that's a key aspect of how to operate a tech transfer office. I'll give it to yeah, Columbia. Great, thanks. And by the way, how many people work in your tech transfer office total? Uh, so it's 14 people on the IP tech transfer side startups and six on the corporate partnerships. Okay, so 20. Um, so yeah, Columbia University, our mission is fairly similar. Primary mission is to get the technologies from the lab into the market to help society. Uh, Life-saving inventions, life-changing inventions. We try to do so where we can at market rate so that there's funding that comes back to the university to support research, education, and teaching. Um, similarly, we try to do whatever the faculty want us to do, which usually means find funding for their research, which is one of our primary missions. And then lastly, and increasingly, and we'll talk about this a bit later, to educate and serve um, the, the, the university more broadly, especially around matters of entrepreneurship. Um, while we are the single point of entry for industry around licensing and sponsored research, we are part of a broad, and I'll borrow Lita Nelson from MIT's famous words, um, I think a a loosely federated uh, anarchy system of entrepreneurship. There's lots and lots and lots of initiatives around entrepreneurship, which actually work together fairly well, but are not run from the same office. Um, we, uh, just some stats for the university overall, around 400. So we're about twice the size, I think, from a research base of Caltech, 700 million or so in, in sponsored research every year. Um, it's led to approximately 400 inventions a year around 100, last year was 117 licenses and options. Of those, half of them were exclusive licenses and options. And of those exclusive licenses and options, half of them were to startups. So startups are increasingly a huge path to market for us. We, um, since I, when I joined, we were doing about five or six patent-backed startups a year. Three years ago, it was 14. Two years ago, 17. Last year, 27. This year, we'll be close to 30. Um, and then all the money that comes in goes back to research. Last year was $195 million of licensing revenue back to the university. We've got a staff of about uh, 40 full-time people plus 35 graduate student trainees. Yes? So, uh, what's your expense if you brought in $195 million? No. <laughs> Uh, no, but that would be great, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, no, I mean, it depends. I think what most universities, you find the, the patent budgets are, you, you, patents are very expensive. So somewhere between one and $10 million of patent expenses. For us, it's typically in the range of nine, this is all published data in autumn, um, $9 million of patent expenses, um, nine to 10. And then you get, some of those get reimbursed. I don't know what your numbers are, but it's, I, ours is a larger budget than many. Um, yeah, we have a. Uh, let's finish the question, uh, the last speaker, and then we'll come back. And oh, sorry. The okay. The so actually, we're being told to hold the questions till the end, which is fine for us as well. Um, so, okay, I've been asked. So I'm going to be doing most of the slide jockeying, but Fred's going to jump in. Uh, so first, we figured we'd do a handful of slides on just the broader national context of what's going on in tech transfer. Then we'll come back to some trends that might be specific for, this, for the ERCs. So at a high level, obviously, there's many ways for innovation to flow out of universities. The most important ones are the ones at the top, publications, jobs, internships, consulting, collaborations, sponsored research. We happen to focus more on licensing and startups. So that's what today's talk is about. That's not to say it's the most important part by any means. Um, so where do universities play in the space? This is the last 23 years of published data across all U.S. institutions. So this is everybody in the U.S. About $800 billion of research went into the universities. That's led to about 300,000 invention disclosures across the history of tech transfer. Of those, 55% received a patent application. At Columbia, it's a little bit closer to 65 or 70. We tend to file more broadly than most. I don't know if you know your stats for those. Yeah, it's about uh, 50. About 50, so, okay. And then 40% of those patent applications end up getting awarded. So you're now down to 25% or 20, 25% of the inventions get uh, an awarded patent. And it's led to all sorts of licenses, 37,000 active licenses and options, almost 10,000 startups, a whole bunch of drugs and devices. I don't know where that jobs number comes from, by the way. Um, it's very hard to count jobs, but it's in the autumn reports. Um, unfortunately, the beginning of our process, so a successful license, the end of ours, sorry, where we pop the champagne and celebrate because we licensed something to Pfizer or got NEA or flagship to take a license, is just the beginning 
of their funnel. So the, the happy end of our funnel is the highest risk portion of their funnel. So when we license something to Pfizer, it becomes one of the hundred pharma compounds, one of the hundred that might make it to market. And in the venture capital portfolio, one in 10. So the successful products to market are pretty rare for us. Um, and this is at universities that do fairly well at this space. Um, just to take you through what that means, this is not that revenue is the most important thing, but it is quantifiable. So this chart here, the x-axis, are the 155 US universities. And the y-axis is their licensing revenue last year. So what you can see is this is a massively skewed returns game. Uh, there's a, a statistic, 85% of the universities in the country lose money in tech transfer purely off the patent budget, setting aside any operating costs. And then even within that, it's a bit of a power law. It's, it's, it's quite skewed. Um, Just one, one comment about yeah. the, the funnel that you mentioned, that the end of our funnel is the beginning of their funnel. Uh, our funnel continues, actually. You know, effect, effectively, it's, it's a marriage uh, when the license starts with a company because they, they, need, um, they may need research to be funded at the university to continue to improve the, the products. And uh, also, the license needs to be renegotiated many, many times. Many times. Or, and I have to stress that the importance of having the actual inventors involved in the commercialization process, it's a key to the success. I, I don't know a single one that was just handed over to a company without any additional interactions. And so that's key to the process. Yeah. Um, so talk a little bit about why this is so hard and why it works so rarely. Um, I hope none of you are planning on launching your own companies immediately because this is a little bit daunting, but take it in stride, it does work. Um, so first of all, one of the reasons clearly the, the off-mentioned valley of death or ditch of despair or whatever you, positive ways you choose to frame it, the essential issue is that the federal government, typically in the foundations, want to fund basic research, which takes you through these early feasibility studies. Unfortunately, the venture capitalists and in industry don't typically want to fund things until they're uh, in early market testing and product development, ready for marketing and sales, and that leaves the valley in the middle, which is where most of our technologies end up getting stranded. Uh, so I think what you've seen is a lot of universities are increasingly focusing on ways to address that valley. Some other reasons this is hard to do, inventions often take years to get licensed. So what this chart shows is 32 years worth of data from Columbia. We took all the licenses we ever did. So forget all the ones we never licensed. All the ones we actually managed to license and looked at how many years from the invention disclosure until the first license. And what you found was that by year three, only 50% of the deals that would eventually get done had gotten done. So what that means is when you look at an invention at year three in a day, you have no idea whether it will never get licensed just from the fact that it's never been licensed so far. These things take a really long time. Well, it costs money to maintain these inventions and patents and all that. So decisions yeah. have to be made. Just a um, comment about the value of death uh, that relates to this whole day here is that um, I think the federal government, as you mentioned, Oren, funds basic research and is now more and more interested in uh, innovation and uh, tech transfer. And somehow they don't, it doesn't put resources into that aspect of things. So for ERCs, I'm thinking, why not allocate, um, just making up numbers, 10% of the budget to uh, programs that will take interesting basic ideas that are promising and then run them through prototyping, maybe feasibility, uh, additional funding for the purpose of commercialization for product development. And that's not something that we see at all, and I'm always a bit uh, skeptical about why that's, that's the case. Right, because it's hard, because if you happen to have a center like that at a university that has resources already and does a lot of that stuff, then fantastic. But if it's a center at a university that doesn't already have those resources, then the likelihood they'll be able to develop them in a meaningful, scaled way is fairly low, unfortunately. It's, it's a very scale-driven game. Yeah, and some universities don't have the resources to even patent mentions. So that is another problem for uh, small universities. Yeah, we'll talk more about that later. Um, so uh, by the way, this chart is not just something at Columbia. We, we segmented this out for physical sciences versus life sciences, for non-exclusive versus exclusive versus things that got licensed for more than a million versus less. It's like the weird Fibonacci chart of tech transfer. So our peers, actually, this is the National Cancer Institute, the University of California, and Cornell. The charts look almost the same. It's a very similar curve. 
Um, blockbusters are unfortunately very rare. So counting on things to become self-sustainable through licensing revenue is extraordinarily dangerous. Um, these are stats, the last year that Autumn collected the data was about 10 years ago, but still it's certainly true for us. Less than 1% of the licenses that you have will generate more than a million dollars a year. At Columbia, we've generated over $3 billion of licensing revenue. It's been 90 some odd percent of it is from four patents. And that's true, we've seen the data from across the universities in the country. If you took out the top patent at most universities, we would all be in the same flat line end of that tail. Um, so it's a hit-based sort of industry, and that has to be fully understood because it's not, you can't bank on uh, revenues coming in on a regular basis, on a, which creates issues for budgeting purposes for presidents and provosts yeah. because it's big peaks and then, you know, people don't have to do with that. Right. Um, and unfortunately, big winners, and by the way, again, you can have a winner because the technology made it to market and saved lives even if we don't make any money. That's fine. <laughs> Um, but if money is what you're looking for, big winners take uh, many years to develop and aren't always obvious. So these are Columbia's four biggest revenue producers. Um, the upper left, lower left, and lower right are biopharma. The upper right is engineering. And what you see is that from the time of the license until the money started coming in was eight to ten years in the life sciences, four to six years in engineering. And in funny, funnily, uh, one of them, which was the Columbia's biggest revenue generator, was actually licensed to a big pharma company, which gave it back because they decided it didn't work. And it was re-licensed to a startup, which then got acquired by one of the big pharma companies. And now it's behind mo many of the blockbuster drugs in the market, we're very happy to say. So it's not ob obvious even to people who know better. And speaking of people who know better, um, our experience mirrors that from most of the big venture capitalists. So uh, Y Combinator, 97% of the returns from two years were from one investment, which they could easily have missed. Uh, Mark Andreessen, Andreessen Horowitz, 20 years of investments will come down to two or three good picks. And the rest is just the cost to play the game. Fred Wilson talking about Ron Conway, a seed fund in the late 90s, one investment out of 100, Google paid for all the rest. So it's not just that we in universities don't know what we're doing. <laughs> There's some very smart people out there who make many of the same mistakes we do. And they have more information than we do because they're later stage and they only make bets are on things that are maybe have a chance. We are like much earlier than that. Yeah, we're making bets when you guys say, I'm flying to a conference tomorrow, we need to file a patent today. That's when we place our bets. <laughs> um, so the good news is way beyond just money, lots of ways that tech transfer influences things. Um, we have two slides, and then we're going to hand things over to Dean. Um, these are more just thoughts, probably to get the breakout sessions going for the afternoon, so possible discussion topics. Um, the first are trends we've observed in tech transfer over the last three to five years, and the second are trade-offs that the ERCs may want, that the committee may want to just keep in mind in terms of uh, ways, the directions for the future. So flip through these quickly. And by the way, things in green are positive from our perspective. Things in red are not. Um, so the positives, uh, the good news is that our sleepy little corner of the world seems like it's become the zeitgeist. Uh, the technology commercialization is talked about on campus, undergrads, graduate, faculty, the mayors, the governors, the president, uh, everyone here. It's become hot. And so it's... Yeah. yeah. So the bad news is that you almost have to have it for the purpose of telling your high ups that you have it, as opposed to really thinking about what is the purpose and what's you know what's going to be sustainable over time. Because when the fashion, the trend is done in five years or less, then it's still an important activity to do, and you don't want to be completely going through you know, like uh, a bubble in 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 this area. Yeah. Although on the other hand, it also makes it really easy to hire great people from industry, um, uh, so it, there's trade-offs. Uh, that's also led to professionalization of tech transfer offices across the country. I don't know how many of you guys have felt this on the ground, but most faculty that I talk to at their university, even if they complain about tech transfer, they say it's better than it used to be. So that's a plus. We'll take whatever we can get. Um, On-campus entrepreneurship has been a huge wave. And I'll come back to why that's so important in a little bit but it has become incredibly important for us to get these technologies to market. And it's, we've, 
we've had to struggle over the years to figure out how to support these. So we, like most of our peers, are inventing this new path. Um, we do things like we have an executives and residence program that we've launched and that many universities around the country have now uh, put in place. We have fixed deal terms for startups. So that we can't custom negotiate 27 startups a year. So we went to a more rational process to try and speed that market along. We have really nurtured our venture capital relationships. We've adopted wholesale the Lean Launchpad process that you'll hear about in a little bit. Um, I don't know if you have other examples of similar entrepreneur in residence, uh, early stage funding for uh, n uh, promising technologies for, for prototyping and trying to grow that to even further down to the commercial path. Just one, one mention about the entrepreneur in residence. We just hired one um, a year ago. He came in with the idea that his job was to, to take technologies out of Caltech. Uh, to create startups, and after a year, he's realized that his job is to keep them inside the university as long as possible to make sure they're ready before they go out. That's a common um, problem with uh, our technology in the universities that they go out often too early and are not ready to for prime time. Yeah. So a couple more of these. Uh, this is going to come as a surprise to no one, but increasingly our job is to help these multidisciplinary, multi-school, so engineering, medicine, engineering and business um, uh, projects and now multi-university collaborations get off the ground. We're thrilled by this. I mean, for Columbia, this is great because we now have startups that have come from engineering and journalism, engineering and architecture. Actually, that one ended up on Shark Tank, which was very interesting. <laughs> um, we had to renegotiate the license with Mark Cuban, um, which was fun. Um, temporarily. We have startups at the law school now using natural language processing techniques for parsing contracts. So it's just very interesting to see the explosion of stuff going on. Um, unfortunately, the patent landscape, we won't dwell on this because we need alcohol. Um, the patent landscape has become very confusing between the Supreme Court decisions, the, uh, consider the patent reform changes going through Congress, um, inter-parties review. It's become very hard for us and especially for our startups to know what they're licensing and whether they have something that has real value or is even sustainable. So that's been very challenging. Um, and unfortunately, licensing IP to big tech, so it, life sciences work great, materials has worked great, um, licensing stuff to the big tech companies has become really challenging. Um, it's, if it's not coming out directly out of research they've sponsored, it has become very hard to get these technologies out the door. And litigation is often the only way to, to, to get to them. And it's nothing we want. Um, so ex increasingly what we're doing is that we're all exploring startups, 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 which you'll hear about from Dean, plus things like patent pools, click licensing, any way we can to get your technology to market in the absence of a voluntary licensing market with big tech. It's just really hard these days. A couple of trade-offs, which we'll lay out for you before we, sh before we stop. Um, things to consider for the future for the breakout sessions. When you're thinking about the ERCs of the future, a couple of things to, to there's a trade-off. Nothing's wrong with any of these, but things to keep in mind. A focus on industry and a focus on startups can be hard to do at the same time. Industry has different time frames for most startups. Industry typically wants non-exclusive licensing to anything that emerges, which is perfectly reasonable, except it's very hard to then have a startup come along because they're going to want an exclusive license and have a much longer time frame. So doing one often means the exclusion of the other. Not always, but often. Um, it's great to think about developing strong new entrepreneurship and commercialization ecosystems in places of this country that don't have them today. Unfortunately, that means you don't get to leverage all the great ecosystems that already exist. And so it's really a trade-off as to what's more important, getting the technology to market as quickly as effectively as possible, or developing ecosystems for the future so that you can do that more effectively in 10 years. I don't know the right answer, but they can be different from each other. Um, blue sky research is fantastic. Truly transformative research is fantastic. It tends to take even longer to get licensed than regular <laughs> near-term research. So we've been holding our graphene portfolio, our photonics portfolio, our AR, VR portfolio for like 10 or 15 years now, which means, to your point earlier, expire. you need budget. You need to be able to pay for the patents. You need to be able to prototype things. And you need to hold on to stuff for a long time. So those aren't easy. They're worthwhile, but they're not easy. Um, Fred's already mentioned this one, but yeah. th you, these things take budget and not all universities have them. And finally, uh, simple metrics are great. Simple metrics are gameable. And we 
tech transfer folks are good at gaming them. Um, and so thinking about what you're actually trying to achieve is a lot better than telling us we're going to measure you on patents. Anybody can buy a patent. The quality of that patent is going to vary tremendously. You could essentially manufacture inventions. You can create startups that aren't real startups. I'm not saying we would do this intentionally, but there's a perverse incentive if you're trying to chase metrics, especially if those metrics are a hard stop for renewal. Um, so just be careful about what you incentivize because it can have consequences beyond what you expected. Um, oh yeah, and you might choose different combinations of these depending on what you're trying to do. So something in semiconductor or so consumer software might bias more towards the near-term industry focus. Some things that are more blue sky, regenerative medicine, photonics, might bias more towards the sort of startups side of the fence.